to the University of YMCA. This organization is celebrating our 150th year, um, which is a really big deal. We had a big celebration several weeks ago, and um, we continue to celebrate this year. Um, the fact that the University of YMCA has been doing this kind of work for 150 years. This particular program, being the Friday Forum, now in partnership with Conversation Cafe, has been happening for 96 years. So you're here as a part of a really long and wonderful tradition, um, and we're glad you're joining us. We are particularly grateful to the Office of Diversity and Social Justice Education um, for their partnership in this program. We've been working together for several years, and it feels really good to be working together on a program that's really important to both groups. Um, Daniela is here today, and she's going to read a list of sponsors and introduce today's speaker. I just want to say personally, um, I'm so grateful to today's speaker for being here. Walter Weinberg is a longtime friend and supporter of the University of YMCA, um, and we're, we're proud to count him among us um, and grateful to him for doing this presentation today. So thank you, Walter, for being here. Daniela, thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Daniela. I'm a social justice with the Department of Social Justice Education. I'm going to go read our Fall 2023 sponsor list that makes Conversation Cafe possible. The Center for Advanced Studies, Center for Global Studies in the U.S. Department of Education, Title VI Grant, College of ACES, College of Edu Education, the Counseling Center, Department of African American Studies, Department of Psychology, Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Education Justice Project, First Mennonite Church of Champaign Urbana, First Presbyterian Church Champaign, Humanities Research Institute, Alumni Hello, Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment, League of Women Voters of Champaign County, Office of the Pro Provost, School of Social Work, Sinai Temple, Social Action Council, Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana Champaign, Student Cultural Programming Fee, Urbana Champaign Friends Meeting, Urbana Champaign Reproductive Justice, and Women and Gender in Global Perspectives. So thank you very much. All right, today we have Walter Feinberg, who is a renowned professor and emeritus at the University of Illinois. He is a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Dewey Society and is known for his work on democracy and education. He served as president of the Philosophy of Education Society and the American Educational Studies Association. Like Anne said, he's a longtime friend and supporter of the University of YMCA, and please take time to check out his books that are out in the lobby. So please, again, just a little reminder, join us next week, which will include a film screening and discussion afterwards with the director. Now I'm going ahead and pass it to Walter. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a, an honor and a great pleasure to be at the Y on, at this end. I'm usually at that end. And uh, also, it's nice to see members of our coffee group here. Um, Walt McMahon, who's a member of that group, is very interested in having uh, students develop uh, maybe some initiative in for the furtherance of democracy. So if anybody is interested in that, you might mention that either to me or to Anne or somebody else, and we could take their names and let's see what could happen. Um, I'm going to talk today about a book that I wrote and which was published this year by Cambridge University Press called Educating for Democracy. I began that book about the time that uh, Donald Trump was announcing he'd run for president. And uh, his, his, uh, his presidency has some influence uh, on what I'm what I'm saying. So you might see that in it. But mostly this book is about democracy and education. And my view is that democracy is primarily not just a system of governance, nor is it just a way to advance each individual's own uh, ambitions, although it is that. But democracy is also a cultural factor. It's a way of being, a way of thinking. And that the most important institution in preparing 
people for a democratic culture is the institution of education. And so it's to that that this book is addressed. And I'm going to do a reading and then hopefully there'll be a lot of time for discussion. And if any time you want to interfere or interfere not intervene, uh, please, let, please do so. So I'll start. It, the book Education, Education for Democracy provides a vision for educational renewal that aims to prepare rising citizens for the responsibility of democratic participation. This vision is designed to fulfill the idea that the most important office in a democracy is citizenship. I argue that citizenship education should provide students with the dispositions and the skills needed to exercise that office judiciously and responsibly as both patriots who care about democracy and custodians who care for democracy. These two aspects of care for, call for curriculum-wide reform, from the arts and the humanities to the sciences and math. The outcome of this reform is a new kind of patriot, one who serves as a custodian of democracy, such that commitment and confidence, heart and mind, love and intellect are brought together for the sake of democratic practice and moral, moral renewal. While nations, as both instruments and proximal objects of care, have an important role to play in this renewal. The ultimate aim is the care and cultivation of a democratic culture. Now, I want to go from there. A lot of this book is, some, a lot of this book is, is reflection on my own experience, not as a, well, somewhat as a teacher, but also as a student in public school. And, I want to begin um, with a description of Mrs. Thompson, my eighth grade history teacher. Mrs. Thompson was the most memorable teacher I had in public school. She never smiled until Christmas, but she was loved by March and remembered forever. She was my eighth grade American history teacher at the Bristol School in Brooklyn, Massachusetts in the early 1950s. Each of her lessons was a performance. If we only knew that Washington crossed the Delaware to uproot the Hessian, the Hessian mercenaries at Trenton on Christmas Day, 1776, knowledge that some today commercialize as cultural capital, she would have thought she failed us, as well as the entire Continental Army. Yes, we were expected to know these facts, as well as the reason for the crossing, but unless we also felt the soldiers' deep longing for their faraway away families, as they shivered on those open boats across that ice River, she would say that we do not understand American history at all. What sticks most clearly in my mind are the lessons she taught about the life and contribution of Wood Woodrow Wilson. For Mrs. Thompson, Wilson was a tragic visionary, a near great president ranking just below Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Defeated by his own body and by his myopic political enemies. According to her, the malicious but successful resistance of Senator Lodge and other Republican senators to Wilson's vision of one world through a united nation, that resistance broke his heart and contributed to his debilitating stroke. 
She also taught us that long after his death, Wilson's vision was eventually realized through the formation of the United Nations with the United States as a charter member. As I mentioned before, Mrs. Thompson was never content with merely reciting names, events, and dates, although she did mention these. Instead, she took pains to guide our empathy. She would get us inside of Wilson's skin and wanted us to feel as he felt with each triumph and each defeat. And so she would act out his encounters with friends and foe life. I came away with a deep appreciation of his contribution to both America and to the idea of a peaceful, interconnected world. She served well the role of an agent of collective national feeling, except for one detail that she neglected to tell us about Wilson. He was a racist. My shot in this section is called my shot. Many years later, when I was teaching a course on the German uh, philosopher Jürgen Habermas and critical theory at the University of Illinois, I had reason to review Wilson's presidency and was shocked to find out that Wilson had premiered a racist film, The Birth of a Nation, in the White House in 1915. For a while, I tried to reconcile this fact with the story of Wilson that I had learned from Mrs. Thompson. At first, I thought that Wilson must have been attracted to the cinematographic innovation of the film, rather than to the glorification of the plan or its depiction of blacks as simple-minded and savage. Given the story that I had learned in Mrs. Thompson's history class, I could only imagine the showing was an oversight by Wilson, and as I as as had I believed earlier to be, I rejected the possibility that it represented conscious and deliberate racism, concluding it was an infatuation with the new film technology. In other words, I interpreted this new information through Mrs. Thompson's lens. Wilson was a good guy, almost a great one. Tragic, certainly, but not bad, wicked, or evil. And thus, he must have intended no harm by premiering the film in the White House. His sin must have been one of omission, not commission. However, in fact, as I learned later, he committed many other sins of commission, including resistance to women's suffrage, the suppression of war resistors, and the Red Scare. Today I think of Wilson differently. Wilson was likely a true racist, actively sharing many of the sentiments of W.B.W. Griffith, the director of the Birth of the Nation. The fact that Wilson premiered the film in the White House was not an oversight, but consistent with his domestic policies. His government promoted white supremacy wherever it could, segregated the civil service and the armed forces, named and named military bases after traitorous Southern war generals, and in my mind, war criminals. Today, this understanding has overtaken Mrs. Thompson's benign picture of our 28th president. And Wilson's reputation is being downgraded, even at his own institution, Princeton, black students are forcing administrators to come to terms with his legacy by renaming buildings and programs that bear his name and by reinterpreting his contribution to the college and the country. But at stake is more than just the name of the building or even the reputation of Wilson. The struggle over names of buildings at Princeton reflects the larger present struggle 
over a national identity, over the question of who we are and just how we are to understand our past understandings of that past. Excuse me. Today, what makes Mrs. Thompson, Mrs. Thompson memorable to me is not just that she presented a racist president as a hero, but rather, <coughs> in addition, that she was a good teacher. And it, it, it is because she was a good teacher that I do not want to be submerged her memory <coughs> by defining her only in terms of the treatment of Wilson. This tension in my own thought is not mine alone. It represents the tension in the nation as representatives of a racist past are being called out. If history is to be understood as more than simply one damn reinterpretation after another, then the tension has to be reconciled and explained without eradicating our capacity for judgment. This, then, is the work of the interpretive dimension of the humanities. Its aim is to understand the intellectual horizon that gives rise to Mrs. Thompson's understanding of wisdom without necessarily endorsing the worldview that Mrs. Thompson likely brought with her to her teaching. And so the rest of the chapter is an attempt to unpack what that's about. Now, history seems to be a kind of obvious uh, subject to talk about citizenship. But I also think that most of the other subjects in the curriculum also have an important role to play. And I'm going to talk about two others. The first one I call the expressive curriculum, and the second is STEM subjects, and I'm going to focus especially on math. So here I go with the expressive curriculum. In 2001, a few days after 9-11, following the World Trade Center bombing in New York City, a bagpipe band, Lastic Lasting Suzer Marches, stormed out of a bar on Straight State Street in Chicago as I was passing by. I felt a strong physical compulsion to keep step with the music, but hesitated because the band seemed to buttress the sporadic anti-Muslim violence that was reported to be occurring throughout the country and in the city in that, on that day. In that context, the Sousa March had a menacing quality and I tried with difficulty to walk out of step to the beat. Now walking out of step to the music has never been difficulty, difficult for me. I can do it on a dance floor easily. But this time I felt trapped by the martial beat of the music. To avoid being controlled by the rhythm of the band, I had to actually stop walking until the music faded into the distance. Only then was I able to amble at my own unregimented pace. I recall this instant, incident to illustrate the power of music and other art forms to, con to control emotions and motivate action. Music and art in general seem to touch our emotions directly, affecting both mood and behavior. Indeed, the source of the word emotion is from the Latin emovere, meaning to move, to agitate, to excite, and to stir. The struggle between my willing legs and my reluctant head represented a larger tension within citizenship education, one between the need for social cohesion and the need for distance and critical reflection. 
This chapter addresses the role of the expressive curriculum, a term that I use to include the educative role of public memorials as well as art and music. In advancing the twin needs of democracy for both social cohesion and critical reflection, Social cohesion involves the moral integration of a society and refers to the degree to which members of society can depend on one another to exercise critical social virtues such as honesty, mutual trust, restraint, and a willingness to sacrifice individual interests to a collective imperative. Critical reflection is the capacity to step outside of one's daily habits and commitments to assess a situation in its larger context. Without critical reflection, social cohesion becomes autocratic and tyrannical. Without social cohesion, critical reflection becomes self-centered and anarchical. But these two are not always easily reconciled, as Plato understood when he advocated the noble lie in order to promote social cohesion. Nor is it easily reconcilable for those who view social cohesion as simply the seeds of irrational, uncritical authoritarianism. And so that gets me into that chapter. The last chapter, the last one I want to talk, uh, introduce, and then I want to talk about these when with you, is uh, math. I mean, few people really think about math as related to democracy, but I want to try to change that view and show that there's an intricate connection. Another chapter I'm not going to read anything from is on science. <coughs> try to show the same thing. Wait a time, so. Um, this is about um, my sixth grade lesson okay. in learning how to divide a fraction by a fraction. Try to imagine when you do that in your mind. When I recall my own struggle learning to divide fractions, I can understand the, the, the um, uh, um, sorry. The following is a loose rendition of my sixth grade lesson on dividing fractions that occurred over 70 years ago. Mrs. Perry setting the problem up on the board, my, the teacher, Mrs. Perry, setting the problem up on the board, said, what is one half divided by one quarter? Next, she starts explaining the steps we needed to follow to solve it. First, she says, let the fraction one half stand as it is, and then change the division sign to a multiplication dot sign. Take the second fraction and invert it so that the four is on the top and the one is on the bottom. Multiply the top number of the fraction, multiply the top numbers of the two fractions together. They are called the numerators. Multiply the bottom fraction, bottom numbers of the two fractions together. These are called the denominators. Mrs. Perry then said, does anybody want to try it? Sam the best math student in the class, and quite a show of him, actually, is the first to raise his hand. He steps up to the board writing, one half divided by one quarter, and then he changes it, one half times four ones equals four twos. Mrs. Perry then says, can you simplify that any further, Sam writes? Four divided by two, equals two. Perfect. Mrs. Perry, very nice. 
sandly beams. Then she hands a piece of yellow paper to each student and tells us to solve for a different problem that she writes on the board. I recall sitting for a long time and staring confusedly at that blank sheet of paper while thinking, it says divide, so why is she telling us to multiply? I thought that one quarter was one fourth of a whole. Now I'm told that it's four holes. This makes no sense to me. Mrs. Perry comes, stands around, and looks at my blank paper. I sense for an, I, I sense or imagine a quiet sigh of disappointment, and then she moves on. So Sam succeeds because he ignores everything we have been taught about division up to that point. Namely, when you see a division sign, divide. While I am paralyzed because my initial intu intuition developed out of past lessons on division is in direct contradiction with the orders that I am now being given. Could this be some kind of trick? Perhaps not, since Sam is praised while well, he discards the past <coughs> instructions in favor of the most recent set of orders. Still, I feel I am the object of subtle disapprovement because I can't resolve the contradiction. To divide or to multiply? That is the question. Should I do what I think is right, or do I follow Mrs. Perry's orders? I am stuck, no matter which option I choose. My paralysis is the result of being presented with a Hobbesian choice, violate my own best understanding, or violate an order issued, issued from on, on high. In the end, I follow Sam's lead, and learn to sublimate my intuition and accept the fact that rules of math are indifferent to what I think they should be, so I never, ever thought to ask first, why is it legitimate to turn a division sign into a multiplication sign? How can one's order suddenly become four ones or four? What is being multiplied when numerators are multiplied together and then denominated? Why is the quotient larger than the, the dividend? Granted, for many purposes, teaching students to apply a simple algorithm is sufficient. The rules of math are largely indifferent to what I think of them. For other purposes, though, perhaps not so much. However, the right answer serves a different purpose when the aim is to prepare students to serve as custodians of democracy than it does when the aim is, say, to produce informed consumers or more efficient bakers. In the former, transparency is a critical part of the aim. We want citizens to be aware of the connection between learning how to follow rule, rules and the reasons the rules work the way they do. With this aim in mind, the right answer functions not as the aim of the exercise, but as a constraint that helps the student examine their own thought processes in a collaborative way. Both with the teacher and others, both with the teacher and other students. Ideally, math is not just about applying algorithms, but about understanding why and how. The advantage of going beyond the algorithm is much like the advantage of fixing a car when you know how the engine works, but the usual routine step to fix it proves to be inadequate. Such knowledge enables a flexible response to unfamiliar problems, which is, of course, a condition of democracy. So that's the meaning in I'd like to open it up to questions. And each one of those is really a set piece to talk about 
in um, more abstract theoretical issues. So you said it takes a uh, you're proposing a, a reform of uh, education for democracy. Where is the vote leaking most uh, drastically? What do you think the, the, uh, the biggest current um, challenges are to prompt uh, you to do something about this? To which? What's, what, problem, what particular um, leaks in the vote are you responding to? Yeah. Well, I, I think we can answer that in two questions, in two ways. The biggest threat to democracy right now is pretty obvious. Is what? The biggest threat, threat to democracy Can right now like, is failure. Like, like, it's on the stand there. Maybe you can hold it for this period. I think the biggest threat to democracy is illustrated this morning in the attempt to apply Republicans to push through um, a speaker who's um, I mean, basically, a tyrant and a trumpet. I mean, that's just kind of a one thing that's going on, and we don't have to elaborate on on that because it just is a fact of our life in this at this moment. I think the biggest threat to education is really more simple. Um, I think it's the attempt to redefine education as simply part of the economic structure of the country. Now that's not all bad. I mean, it, it, more equality would be good. But the idea that somehow education itself is the reason for any kind of economic problems that we have uh, goes back to the Reagan administration and has bought, been bought by educators throughout the country. So every time uh, uh, education is, is challenged, the response has to be, well, it's good for the economy. Or some things going on may be indifferent to the economy. Um, a quick example, um, there was a school, a private school in Chicago um, that was called the corporate school, odd man. But it was set up by a philanthropist who wanted to provide a model for, uh, for public education. And it was in a very poor minority area of Chicago. And so he made sure that the children that were selected for the school from grades one to eight, I think, were drawn on a random basis from the community and reflected the composition of the public school. And then he did a lot of things with them. You know, they had gardens in the classroom. The mothers were brought in and they were, they, they had classes if they were illiterate. They were, anyway, that it was, a, from my observation, it was a good program that served a lot of needs. But they folded. And the reason it folded, as I understand it, was because the test scores didn't indicate enough progress from the, from the student point of view. Without any understanding of all the other possible things that might have been going on. This was the same mentality that closed schools in, uh, I think, South Chicago um, where resulted in kids having to cross over areas where different gangs were in charge. And so, more subject to more violence. The inability, to, it's not that it's wrong to think that education has an important market function to serve. The problem is when that is seen as the only function that it has to serve, and then the way to measure its goodness is only used to measure that function. That would be what I would think to be the most serious threat to education. 
on, on that thread, I think there's a whole book to be written about how the small schools movement inside of the uh, Chicago public school system was sort of hijacked by the charter school. Mm -hmm. There was one that Rahm Emanuel was advocating called the Noble Project, or the Noble School, and they actually fined kids monetary expenses for it. Like fractions, it was really ludicrous, it seems to me. But I wanted to talk about higher ed, and uh, I think there's a, obviously there's this threat, for the know nothings that's going on right now, but predating that is the whole adjuncting of the faculty, and the fact that uh, it came up in discussion at the uh, sustainability contest uh, discussion here at the Friday Forum about how self censorship of professors is palpable because they're either in, waiting to get in tenure track, in tenure track, or not even in tenure track at all, and where it can be fired at will um, after a year. So the, the stifling of, of free debate uh, and dissident ideas is, is, I think, staggering and not commented on. So what do you think? Did, did you want to say more? Well, I mean, it, I think it, it goes, I think you're right. It, it, the university is under siege, quiet siege, and self censorship is a part of that. I'm sure that all self censorship is, is bad. I mean, I think thinking about what you're going to say is a good idea, and not saying some of the things that you might want to say is not a terrible idea either. That's, you know, the point of racist, anti racist speech is. Self-censorship, so that's not bad, but I think it goes somewhat deeper than that into the different ways in which universities have started to be financed, where um, each unit is responsible for its own, you know, support, its own, which then creates a competition among the units in the university for funding and students without a discourse or a minimized discourse about what the role of the university is. And so what suffers here greatly, I think, are the humanities. Because what are the humanities? The humanities you don't make any money out of. An English degree, you might do okay, but then there's no guarantee. Whereas a computer science degree, of course, there is. So the competition for um, resources that's set up internally within a university is a serious concern as to how you're going to find define what counts as merit within the university itself. It seems to me that we live in an age where persuasion has a higher value than truth seeking. And our whole economy is based on advertising and marketing, which are basically forms of propaganda for the purpose of persuading. And our politics have become primarily uh, the art of persuasion through propaganda. So, given the primacy of advertising and marketing and our form of politics, how do you think that education can be turned around so that we, uh, so that students are taught to value truth seeking and critical expression more than persuasion? Again, I, mean, I, I do think the humanity is well proper, properly and well taught and relating to how students think about things and helping them become aware of their everyday, the implications of their everyday habits and the surroundings is very helpful. Again, I'll give an example. Um, in 1948, an instructor named Will Burnett, his area was science education, um, gave an assignment to his students. Uh, 
You might remember the campus in 1948, there very, very few African American students. There were a few, they, there were no dormitories for African American students. The barbers in the, in the community would not cut African American hair, and the restaurants were largely segregated. So uh, Professor Burnett gave the assignment to his class, you know, sort of a social science assignment to find out whether how many restaurants served African Americans in their dining room or had them have to, you know, take the food out if they were served at all. Now, that assignment got the attention of one of the uh, vice chancellors, I'm not sure which one, I think it was the vice chancellor for academic affairs, if there was such a role then, or maybe it was the chancellor. And he wrote a letter to the dean of the college, a man named Spalding, saying, I, I, I hear that one of your professors has given this assignment to his students. Don't you think that that makes them too exposed to the problems of the world? I'm paraphrasing. Um, and the dean wrote back a very informative letter about how, how it actually did fit into a science curriculum. And as far as I know, he never mentioned that letter to the instructor. In other words, he protected that instructor from the uh, need to think about even self-censoring himself. Now, when you have administrators that have that kind of character and that kind of understanding of the values that they are supposed to represent, then you can have a faculty um, and, and a university that is actually pursuing truth. When you don't, when you have a faculty and an administrator that is all, I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be worried about finances. Believe me, as a former faculty member, I know that's important. But when that becomes the only thing to think about, or the primary thing to think about, then you're open to the, um, to the uh, infiltration of the kind of lies that we've had. I even see it in the battle over the chief, you know, and all the donors. A lot of the donors wanted to die when the chief issue came up for consideration. They were ready to leave their donation behind. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um, not, not really. Okay. Um, and I was thinking more in terms of elementary school uh, and high school. Once students get to college, their values are pretty much set, and their ways of thinking are pretty much set. It takes a lot to overturn but in terms of educating younger people to think critically and seek the truth, it seems to me you have to confront the propaganda in their everyday world of all those persuaders trying them to purchase things, to do things. And education should unpack those processes and inoculate students against propaganda and appeals to their emotion. And this is the kind of critical thinking that I think is needed for democracy well, I, to I, succeed. I, I, but I but the you. problem I see is that if, if anybody tried to implement that, there would be a human and cry that would destroy the economy because people wouldn't be <laughs> subject or they wouldn't be so influenced by advertising. I'm, I'm not so sure that I think that may be more freedom than uh, you think, although um, you might want to remember that charter schools were mentioned, the attempt to establish, I forget his name, 
um, these charter schools that would, uh, and the only requirement for the students where they had to listen to advertising for a certain amount of time every, every day. Christopher something or other was this man's name. So I mean, it, that, that at least made it very open <laughs> what they're doing. But I think you could teach students to be aware of the health risks of too much pizza, too much Coca-Cola. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a direct confrontational, these things are bad for you. Well, it's one thing to teach the benefits of, of health and how healthy pizza is for you. It's another thing to unpack the forms of persuasion that are used to try to make peace a desirable. So, in that sense, I don't, uh, that I think, in other words, directly analyzing specific propaganda campaigns, I mean, ad campaigns, to unpack what they're doing and to make, uh, or, or to help students be aware of their own feelings and how those feelings are being manipulated by the advertising. And that kind of education, I, I don't see happening. I, I kind of agree with you, although maybe the only place we might disagree is I think it's possible for it to happen. Um, maybe subterraneanly, but it, but it does in some schools with some teachers. And part of the problem is, you're right, but part of the problem is the pressure that will come um, from the pizza parlors and the community that donate pizzas for students who, you know, collect this many, much money for the United Way or whatever. But, um, no, you're right. You're right about that. Um, when you see education policy, like, with Governor DeSantis in Florida, you know, and his personal ban on AP African American studies, do you think that kind of censorship is just a reflection of how radical and polarized some people in our government are today? Or do you think that kind of censorship is going to continue to happen and we should be worried? It's going to continue. I mean, I wish I could say it's not, but it's, it is going to continue. It, it's, it's, and again, I think uh, the best uh, medicine for it is an educated public who's able to stand up, you know, one that goes to school board meetings, um, board meetings, and is as present as the right wing is present, I thought it was more so. Then I think when the community hears each other in a closed space, with some rules of civility set up, then I think things can change. But um, right now I don't see the climate for that happening, except on the large political scale. That, that, um, hopefully DeSantis will you know, lose his platform. I don't know he will. Part of it, I think, I mean, part of this is always present. And part of it is, as people's habits become challenged, they can either try to find the reason for the challenge, or they can stand firm on their old habits. And again, I've been here since 1967, it's a fairly long time. And I've seen a lot of things happen. And I've seen a lot of things that didn't happen until they happened. Um, for example, when I first came, there were a lot of protests around Vietnam 
and um, African American uh, uh, issues. When I came, there were only two, I think there were two African American faculty members at the university. And um, as I said, they were just beginning to open up the homes. It was a Project 500 that after Martin Luther King's brought in 500 African Americans and that. That was traumatic for them and for people at the university. Whenever, what you never heard about at that point, you knew the protests were there. There was never a word spoken about the chief the symbol of the university. I mean, I figured I would know that. You know, I was in those marches in Vietnam, civil rights, and I didn't have the chief in my head. And I asked other people of my ilk about that. They didn't either. So it was only maybe in the early 80s, late 70s, at the most, that that issue began to percolate very slowly. And it took a pretty courageous administrator, Nancy Cantor, I think it was, to abolish the chief, and she lost her job. So these things percolate slowly. There are things that everybody in this room, is, as lovely as we are, as good people as we are, there are things that everybody in this room today take for granted and that at some point it's going to come up and be challenged. Um, women's sports was, that was silly. Why would women want to play hockey or basketball? Well, after a while, some of these things take hold, and if you prepare minds that are not willing to take on everything that comes up, but minds that are really a little bit open to perhaps walking out of step with the music occasionally, then I think you can uh, make some progress, but we shouldn't ever think that we have all the answers because we don't. We don't even have all the questions. Uh, I just want to say thanks. And I want to say this. As a kid growing up myself in my 60 years of life, and growing up to learn and understand how we come together, uh, I grew up through school busing, busing some of the kids and minorities to such schools. And then when I think back, just during the Trump administration in 2017, and I get this as long as I live, as far as Charlottesville, Virginia, as we seen where there was anti-Semitism on the campuses, you know, Jews were other places, and I, I find that much of the stomach this whole matter, even today. And now in Israel, I'm the board, and the mess, once again, we have banks. And what can we do in this century, and years for students to be safe and to eradicate all of these anti Semitism and messages that may hit us once again. I think every student has every right to get an education, minority or majority of such religion. You know, where, how will we, you know, how can we eradicate this? Uh, and I'm, I believe there's, there's tools in every toolbox where we can just say, hey, this is not right. So, what can we do? for the one I was going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do it in a couple of minutes. What was it? Walter, how do we get your book? Uh -huh. how, how do we get the new book? Um, well, Amazon, 
uh, has copies. Um, I don't think there are many discounted copies, unfortunately, yet. Yeah. But they're, but they're not, not that expensive. They don't buy the hardback. That'll break you. But the paperback's about just under thirty dollars, yeah. and Amazon has it. Um, also, if you call Barnes and local Barnes and Noble and tell them to order it, then maybe they will at the university bookstore. Anything. I'm, I'm not about um, pushing sales. Yeah. Well, I'm just gonna talk about the idea of civility. I remember trying to read a Edgar Z. Friedman book on civility in, in academia or something. I don't think I finished it, but. But the whole point I'm, I'm trying to get at is that the chief discussion was called uncivil. You can't do that. So defining this discourse as uncivil and saying, you know, this has no place in academia is also stifling of debate. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, some discourses has to be, has to break the existing rules of stability. But, I think in small groups, when you're trying to change people, um, yelling is going to 